Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 292. I'm not going to do the hand signals because that's a bit weird, but it's episode number 292 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, coming at you live and direct from YouTube. If you're streaming it via your audio streaming plug, plug class or podcast, whatever you call them, platforms, then you should be hearing me through your earlobes. If you are listening to this via the audio podcast, why not share the podcast with your family and friends? Give it a five-star rating. huh? That would be nice to run it. If you could do that, that would be great. If you watch it via YouTube, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment. You know, this is the number one culture and streetwear podcast in the world. If you want everything concerning culture, all things concerning streetwear, you come live and direct here. This is the home of all that information. None of those other places that are weird and scattered around the internet. No, 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 no. Right here, right here, right now. Um, so let's get on to the show. It's a bit late, as you can tell by the background where I am. Um, I'm somewhere in the depths of East London. The location is going to be undisclosed for now. And um, yeah, it's what week one of um, self isolation, week one of a temp, kind of like a semi lockdown, but not really. So, sort of like a soft lockdown. I'm sure most of you guys are aware of the current situation going on now with the whole coronavirus pandemic sweeping the globe. Um, various uh, levels of sever well, there's various levels of severity in terms of the situation at hand. Some places are, you know, dealing with uh, death tolls in the high thousands. Some are dealing with it in the high hundreds. But everyone's addressing it in their own different sort of unique way. And I guess maybe it's a really fair representation or fair reflection on nation's temperament and people's attitude towards crises in general, right? I think um, I mentioned it previously to a friend that I think the Italian response to the coronavirus was a little bit lax in the beginning, but then they seem to have kind of stepped it up once a lot of their elder uh, population started to you know um succumb to the you know to the the sort of virus in general and i guess maybe because it's a mediterranean um country they have a different association with their older population well with people that are a bit older people that are 16 above there's a lot more respect there they are kind of like you know the sent the figureheads of the family in some respects so the idea that you'd lose somebody that kind of held the family down over a long period of time was something that a lot of them didn't really want to see so they made the precautions or they were you know they kind of abided by the rules and by the laws i saw some videos of some italian people kind of getting wrestled to the ground but for the most part they seemed like they got on top of it once they realized it was a big 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 issue and it was something taken quite seriously and then i guess when you look at the other side of the, of the or when you look at you know when you go further west United Kingdom, United States, or North America, you definitely see a different attitude when it comes to the virus. Mostly because you see people, um, you see people saying that you know the whole COVID, you know COVID nineteen thing is a hoax, is some sort of way to like, for the government to control everyone, which I don't really have a problem with. To be fair, um, I think you know conspiracy theories are here to stay. I think with the advent on the internet. I think there, there might have been a period where conspiracy theories might have died down, right? They might have been relegated to the fringes of mess, the fringes of the internet, like message boards, right? Or darkness stuff. Or, you know, they might have been just regular, uh, relegated to like, you know, occupying pages of, you know, random zines that you might get handed to you once you go to like a squat party or something. But I think as soon as social media took off, and as soon as people had the ability to kind of connect everyone all over the world via email or via whatever, right? Discords and shit it was inevitable that um conspiracy theories would live on and even more so i think you know what really gave the conspiracy theories another lease of life youtube youtube was a platform people could go on there and make these really compelling slideshows with really omni o- ominous kind of like you know uh, voiceover that's really deadpan doesn't inflect anything it just tells you the quote-unquote facts so i'm not surprised that happened so if you are somebody that's a bit you know on the fence about what's actually happening and why it's happening cool but to debate that it's fake or that it's not really a thing like how Walker Flocker did the other day is just insane that's the conspiracy theory I can't get behind it's sort of similar to when um it was alleged that Alex Jones said you know those kids in Sandy Hook weren't really shot in that school right that's when people go all right cool your conspiracy theory is all right when you're saying you don't believe the government and you want to you know you're a libertarian uh 
whatever it may be, right? That's all well and good. But then when you start saying, you know, what people are actually going through, the pain that they're suffering in their families through losing loved ones, you know, uh, on the hands of a virus they didn't know existed a couple months ago, that's not on. So, again, I'm not too... Because I think there's a... Oh, I bumped into quite a few people who are very much so on the fence with the whole coronavirus. They don't really think it's a thing. Um... They think it's a complete overreaction, which is one of the things you hear a lot of people talking about. Like it's an overreaction. Oh, it's just not as bad as a common flu, but I don't know, bro. I would like to err on the side of caution, I think. And um, I think um, it's a two-week thing, right, for the most part. Well, it is here in the UK, and I don't really have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with kind of... um doing away with the constant need to be outside and you know getting drunk and hanging out and just generally fucking around in it i could do with i could do without that for a two-week period especially in the run-up to summer because i've got a feeling <coughs> sorry about that because i've got a feeling i had a feeling before this anyway that this summer was going to be pretty sick i think it started off pretty shaky right some really um um horrible celebrity deaths towards the end and the beginning of the year kind of set a bad tone but i had a feeling that the summer was going to pop off and i think it's going to be even better especially off the back of you know people kind of um coming out the other side with this whole uh pandemic i have a feeling the summer's going to be really really cool um so if that's the case i'm not i'm not that against having a couple of a couple of weeks maybe a month of quiet a bit of peace a bit of tranquility get back to basics right um reconnect with friends family all that sort of good stuff help out your community and then once the summer comes in you know get white get wasted i'm not i'm not against that whatsoever but i don't know man there's some people who are really struggling with this you know the kind of people that really need to you know the kind of people that really struggle with uh being alone i guess you'd call them extroverts right i wouldn't say i'm an introvert really i I just say I, i just know how to occupy myself um uh, I just know not to I just I don't know I don't get bored easily I guess that's probably the thing that helps me a lot um, I guess if you're someone that suffers from boredom it's a bit difficult but I don't get bored in it I've got loads of books to read I've got a new one there actually I need to check out um, I've got stuff to write I've got a blog you should check that out yeah defaultgoon.com um, I can record a DJ mix I can make a podcast I can draw something whatever in it I don't know i could arrange rearrange my uh record box which i needed to do actually it's something i've got on my mind um especially during um this uh downtime go for my record box and make sure i've got all my crates and my playlist sorted out there's so much stuff to do even if you're not into all that sort of stuff i mentioned you know there's tons of stuff you could do around the house um to keep you occupied or just you know catch up on some movies there's tons of good stuff that's come out over the years or over the last couple of years actually over the last couple of months um even on netflix that people should be watching um so yeah i'm lucky i don't get bored but people that are you know extremely extrovert the people kind of people that wind down the week by you know hump day and friday and friday and all that sort of shit they're the ones suffering the most because you know don't get me wrong you can still have a drink but it's not the same in it if you if you're if you're if you associate your drinking with going out to some glitzy pub somewhere in central london and now you're confined to your four walls in your bedroom especially if you're sharing an apartment you're just gonna be you know you'd want to jump out the window right um i kind of get that but take it easy it's all well and good we're kind of we're gonna get through this in the end i think and i think it's some it's a good type of bit of downtime and it's good just to kind of relax take it easy take your foot off the pedal a little bit um especially if you're working from home Imagine working from home and then still having to have social obligations and shit. It would just be a long thing, innit? The only other thing as well that's really mad about it is that, you know, I've got, I've got no haircut. My hair looks mad, beard looks mad, but again, I'm not I'm not against it. Why am I going to get a haircut now? Number one, I put myself in danger. And number two, where am I, who am I going to go out to impress now with this fresh trim that I, I'm, I would want to, I would have to get. Makes no sense. And especially if um, the employment market stays the way it is and people are struggling for freelance work like i am it's probably not the best time to be spending you know stupid amounts of money on stupid things because you never know what may happen at the end of the month we might get to a position where like you know suddenly it's like oh it's back to normal now go back to work and then it's like hmm, got no job to go back to mate all my clients have ducked do you know what i mean <laughs> that might be a mad one but yeah um, so far in london it's been a bit of a madness 
don't really see many people wearing face masks either. The face mask thing has been a bit hit and miss for the most part. Just as an observation, I'd say mostly foreigners are wearing them, right? Mostly expats are wearing them. Let's say, I don't know how you deem people who aren't uh, citizens of the UK, but there's no, you know, British citizens. There are, I, I'm, not, I'm not really seeing many British citizens wearing a face mask. Most of the people that are wearing them are people that you would assume would wear them. Or what I have been seeing, I have been seeing a lot of mums actually taking precautions with their kids. Um, so wearing face masks for themselves and stuff so they make sure their kids don't get ill. That's pretty cool. But apart from that, people are a bit lackadaisical, I think, about the most part. Especially on the trains. I think the overground train that passes my crib is still quite packed in the mornings. I don't really see a difference there. So maybe we'll see a difference in the next couple of weeks, especially off the back of Boris Johnson announcing that schools are going to close this Friday. That might make some change. Because um, I'm assuming a lot of the transport or a lot of the commuting in the morning is people, you know, starting their early shifts and a lot of, you know, families, parents taking their kids to school or kids going to school on their own. So that might slow down over the next couple of um over the next couple of days as well, heading into the weekend. We might see a bit of a dip in that. But I think personally for me, I'm a, I'm alright with it, man. I'm good. I've got loads of stuff to do. So no problem with me. Let's move on to this one. So let's get into some topics. Um talking about all things corona. I saw this really funny article. Well, not funny because, you know, she's a bit of a donut, but it, it was just funny video. Vanessa Hudgens had a bit of a oopsie um, talking about the coronavirus, which is, you know, which is to be expected, really, isn't it? When, whenever there's a, whenever there's something that happens in society, I don't know why it is. I don't know why um, celebrities have this weird need to jump out of the window or to, like, get in front of a camera and speak. Um if you're employed to well for the most part it's not everyone anyway because there's you know there's there's a huge swath of actors you'd never hear from unless they're making a movie right but there are some actors who just can't get enough of it right and it's weird because actors have i don't know if you could calculate it but actors probably have the highest amount actors probably average the highest minutes on camera right of any sort of like public figure i'd say because if you think about it, if, especially if you're a very well-known actor, you will do, I don't know, let's say three, let's say four movies a year to be, you know, or three movies a year to be generous, right? Every movie you're doing, especially if it's got a big budget, you're going to do a, a huge press jump, press run for it, right? You're going to be on radio, you're going to be on TV, podcast, YouTube shows, you're going to be everywhere. You're going to do, you know, um, print interviews with Metro, Guardian, Daily Mail, whatever it may be. You're going to go all over the gaff. That's going to be a whole bunch, whole bunch of promo, plus the stuff you're going to do in your social media. Times that by three. You're going to be on, you're going to be in front of a camera a lot. I never got, I, I, I just assumed if you're going to be on a camera that much, even for myself on this kind of low, tiny, fucking shitty webcam level, right? I get tired of seeing my face in front of a camera after a while. I get tired of hearing the sound of my own voice. How much so for an actor who's employed or paid to do it? Like, you know, you, you've got handlers who are licking your ass. You've got agents who are licking your ass. Managers who are licking your ass. Um, you know, studio execs who want you to be in their film. They're licking your ass. It's constant, um, you know, constant praise, constant lifting up of your ego. You're going to want to have a bit of a break from that, aren't you? Really? Wouldn't a rational person want that? Just a bit of a chill time on your own, just so you're not performing. But not for Vanessa Hudgens, it seems like. So Vanessa Hudgens got on, got on Instagram live and decided to give her two pence on what's actually going on with the coronavirus and delivered probably one of the worst takes I've heard in a long, long time. Um, so this article here from TMZ, of course. Who else would be reporting such nonsense? Um, here's a video of it, right? So Vanessa Hudgens. So this is the, the article from TMZ. Vanessa Hudgens, uh, people is just dying inevitable, inevitable right? <laughs> Apologize, of course, for the comment, but this is the original video. She says people dying is just inevitable. Like, but I've seen this, I've seen this sort of like um take on social media a lot. It's sort of like an extension of the oh um, the, I got a strange feeling. This is mother's work, and this is mother nature's way of saying you. We have to um take notice of how we're treating the world as hu as a human race and all that sort of nonsense right it's like an extension of that you hear a lot of vegans say that it's a lot of, it's kind of a vegan method it's a kind of a vegan pov to look at stuff like in this weird macabre way as if like you know or have you seen that picture of the 
the river in Florence, right? With all the boats and shit. And it, oh, it's all cleared up now because humans are not there. It's this, it's this kind of weird, um, I don't know, this weird fetish that they want to, you know, erase the human race so that the Mother Nature could go back to being the Garden of Eden. Aren't they aware that if they erase human, human, the human race, that includes themselves and all their, all their family and friends and their loved ones? It's a very bizarre way to look at it. But anyway, let's listen to what Vanessa has to say because you know, in times like these, you want to hear from Waka Flock of Flame and you want to hear from Vanessa Hudgens, right? <laughs> um, yeah, till July sounds like a bunch of bullshit. I'm sorry, but like, it's a virus. I get it. Like. I respect it, but at the same time, like... You know what she's got, actually? Looking at her video, listening to her speak. She she did that thing where she went, um, all right, you know, eyes up into the sky, flicking up the hair. She's got the hot girl virus. That's what she's got. Throughout her entire life, she's been, you know, people have wanted to suck her toes, you know, run their fingers through her hair, stare into her eyes, kiss the corners of her cheeks. Like, people have wanted to touch and feel this woman from the very time she, you know, this grew into her female body she's had no um no roadblocks she's had she's, she has had to navigate uh uh rejection she's not had to deal with rejection in any kind of way so and again she's you know isn't she like a disney star or something right but there's i'm not sure they all look the same it's like a three of them that will kind of have the same sort of appeal but for all of that you don't really i wouldn't it's not the best circumstances or platform for somebody to have very well-rounded reasoned uh well thought out intelligent point of views regarding a global pandemic i'm not i don't i'm not expecting that but it's just the shallow nature of it and again it might be because she's just high she could be on a she could be she could have popped a couple benzos and she's just you know flying free and just thought you know what um you know what guys i don't think this is but it's an insane thing to record isn't it like it's just a really strange thing to record in your own home and just imagine what the agent just imagine what the manager just imagine what the personal assistant is thinking once they log on and see this video sometimes and again maybe they're not even watching it live because they might have their own families they've got to look after they've got a kid somewhere in the kitchen trying to you know reach up to the chest of drawers or pull down a whole uh chest of knives into their chest so they have to make sure that kid doesn't die they might have a dog that's shit all over the apartment whatever and then you get told you get a text message pinging into your iMessage that one of your star clients decided to go on ig live and inform the world that she thinks uh people dying is inevitable and it's some sort of like sign from god that she should be the number one actress in the world <laughs> oh god like even if everybody gets it like yeah people are gonna die it's just terrible but like inevitable it's inevitable right so what what about you dying then vanessa is that inevitable huh what about you dying what about somebody sprinkling a bit of coronavirus in your fucking you know manhattan would you like that <laughs> like it's just insane man. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this right now. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't. Because you know what's funny? You know, you know what's funny? Not funny. She's essentially costing the livelihood of her. But then that's the thing. That's a good thing about this, right? Um, that's a, one of the only slight glimmers of hope. The only, you know, the only uh, silver lining in this story is that you can't get cancelled now. No one's going to cancel you, right? Because there is no industry to cancel you, right? Hollywood has essentially come to a grinding halt. Shows are, you know, the only late night shows are being sh recorded in front of um, empty studios. I saw the other day, I think St Stephen Colbert did his kind of monologue in his bathtub somewhere. In a, ba in a bathtub, so I'm not sure if he's in his actual own apartment. But no one's any, no one's recording anything in any studio, right? They're all kind of on lockdown because I'd, I'd assume no studio wants to be liable for uh, talent contracting any kind of virus, right? Um, especially in these try in this, in these testing times. So she's lucky that she can't get cancelled. But it's just funny that she would, you know, inevitably this would kind of lead to maybe a change in management, a change in representation. But yeah, and then of course the the typical kind of reply, the typical it's the typical kind of um, flow. I think you could go on TMZ and you could see probably loads of these as apologies, the same sort of routine, big headline, update in the sub subtitle, then you have the quintessential notes app apology, right? 
that's obviously been pre written and sent to a copywriter and maybe approved by a manager whatever maybe and the apology is like hey guys as the usual kind of you know youtuber kind of alert for the fans i'm sorry for the way i have offended anyone for the way i have offended anyone and everyone who has seen the clip from my instagram live yesterday i realized my words were insensitive and not all appropriate for the situation of our country and the world is our in right now this has been a huge wake-up call about the significance of my words have that's just insane you needed this kind of slip up to realize that you have a big voice that doesn't make any sense whatsoever because the same person that's saying this would be the same person that is gonna go on a red carpet wearing a couture dress by fucking you know Givenchy and tell you that they're an activist because they stitch some words on it like what <laughs> anyway um so now more than ever um, i'm sending safe wishes to everyone to stay safe and healthy during this time we don't need your stay safe and safety messages but hey whatever and in the video you know what the text is fine but the video is super super flagrant the video reminds me of those non-apologies you get from makeup artists on youtube where they don't really they don't, they don't they're not really sorry they're just saying it as an exercise because they know their fans are gonna row with them anyway and if you have Vanessa Hudgens and you are a Disney star, which I assume she is, I'm not going to do any research on it because I can't bother. You know, I can't waste no more time on Vanessa Hudgens. But if you are a Disney star, you would probably be like, you know what? Fuck it. I said what I said, right? Because you know you got your fans are going to ride you anyway. And this is the second video from her, of course. Hey guys, so yesterday I did an Instagram live and I realized today that some of my comments are being taken out of context. Um so in the text that she wrote, she didn't say that out of context. And you can't take them out of context because you said what you said. You were commenting on the coronavirus, on the global pandemic, and you said that it was inevitable. Some people were going to die. No big deal. That's there's no. What's the what, what context are we missing here? Um, it's a crazy time. It's a crazy, crazy time. And I am at home and in lockdown. And I legit thought she was going to start singing there. It's a crazy time. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy. I honestly thought she was going to start singing something. Like, just start. And she does that thing with her hair all the time. Like, she's very conscious about how she looks. And again, I think it works for her in her everyday life. I think if Vanessa Hudgens pissed you off and you're a dude and she started like, it's crazy time, babe. I'm sorry. You know, he was just, he was just dead. I just stumbled and fell on his dick, didn't it? What can I do? It's just, I think you just forgive her, innit? Because you're just doing all this hair puffing and looking at you with those brown eyes. But Jesus Christ. And that's what I hope you guys are doing too. In full quarantine. So what, what? So what is that? Is that like a weird sort of diss? I hope you guys that are dissing me are also inside. It's like what the. F and staying safe and sane. Um, yeah. Ah, she's trash, man. Trash human. But yeah, I'm not gonna watch the end of it. Check out yourself. Vanessa Hudgens being a trash human is what it is, isn't it? Um, I don't blame her in it. She's had a life of luxury, and she suffered from the pretty girl virus where no one's told her to shut the fuck up ever in her life. So, um, yeah, insane insane young lady let's move on to that one uh what else do we have here on the list i wanted to talk about du, 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 du. americans are dumb that's something that we know already this is a really is this a funny video what, what how is this video? into a live look now at the beach with i think this is a video from yeah this is from the beach right finished during spring bake which isn't again i'm gonna be a bit of a contrarian on this issue right i don't think i'm down with the whole like shaming of people who are not taking the coronavirus seriously i think we all have we all have the internet we all have um access to media um some people are just not willing to accept that it's a big and it's as big as an issue of the people are making out which is okay it's your prerogative i guess the added advantage is that the coronavirus as we all know is only affecting a certain segment of the population the symptoms are pretty self-evident sometimes they are they're not self-evident but there is a protocol in place for everyone to kind of deal with it in a sensible and hopefully a helpful manner, right? So if that's the case and you are somebody who's and you and or maybe let's say the flip side, let's say you are in tune with everything that's going on, you understand the severity of it, but you're also looking at the numbers and you're like, you know what, it hasn't really hit the States yet. It hasn't hit North America the way it's hit other parts of the globe, such as, you know, Far East Asia, Eastern Europe central europe western europe whatever right i get it so maybe they're thinking we might have a, this is only their last week because it's quite advantageous actually in the states that um st patrick's day spring break 
has kind of fell in the same sort of weekend. I'm sure, I'm sure it happens all the time anyway. Um, it's fell in the same sort of two week weekend, but it's also fell with it's also perfectly lined up with the UK kind of peak spike is approaching. That means that the states is probably going to have their worst kind of outbreak towards i'm gonna say the end of april I'm, I'm assuming judging by what the months are doing now obviously touch wood it doesn't happen and the states don't get what we had in europe but judging by what's happening in other places it's inevitable it's gonna hit a speak it's gonna hit a spike or a peak during the end of april in the states so maybe people are like you know what it's a calculated risk i'm gonna go to the beach i'm gonna hang out with my friends because this might be the only time i get to do it so i'm not really down with the whole like shaming of people oh my god i can't believe they're going out and hanging out with people it's just so irresponsible it's like look they know what the risks are um it's pretty clear you know trump went from their dead president actually donald trump went from you know not thinking it was a big deal to suddenly the other day going on you know standing on a pulpit and looking like he looking completely white and super tired and shit so obviously he got told some information that we're not privy to and he kind of acted you know and kind of corrected course and has dealt with it accordingly so they know the severity of it and if they want to go to the beach let them go to the beach innit so this is a video from um what is this from abc new abc action news right this is quite funny and they kind of detail exactly what's spring going break on. underway the beach is one place where everyone seems to be going despite warnings about large gatherings i want to show you this video that our is in clear water talking to city leaders about the changes that could be coming the threat of coronavirus isn't keeping people away from the sand. We found packed coastlines all the way up and down and Pinellas County's beaches. The, the beach see how, is... See how, see how funny that was, that she jumped out of the way of the camera. <laughs> packed coastlines... <laughs> The threat of coronavirus isn't keeping people smooth, away from the it? sand. We found packed coastlines all the way up and down Pinellas County's beaches. The beach is slammed. Traffic is jammed as thousands of people flock to the sandy shores of Clearwater Beach. If you look around. So what, has nothing changed then? Is this like a standard, is this like a standard weekend or is it just like, why are people going to the beach during the week like this at this time? Is that like a thing? Because these don't look like spring breakers to me. People are still just living their lives and doing everything. The restaurants are packed, the beaches are packed. With theme parks and nearby attractions closed, visitors from Florida and across the nation snagging a spot okay, in the right sand. Right. We're definitely still worried about it, but it's not something that we're like letting consume our spring break, I guess. Clear would you know you would you kind of have some sympathy for them right? Three young girls who are, you know, it's spring break, you only get one spring break, especially during your, you know, during the, the years that matter, you know, you can't be going to spring break when you're 26. You want to go between the ages of like, you know, 18 and 21, really, maybe max 22. Um, you bought your lovely little bathing suit from Fashion Nova. You've ordered it from some random Chinese place and you're wondering why it's taking seven weeks to arrive. Little do you know, right? So they've prepared a while to get there, right? And they finally got there and breathing down their necks somewhere in the in in a foreign land is this virus they've not really heard about um potentially coming over to their shores i can understand the calculated risk again if, if, if i was a parent would i be happy with it obviously not if i was a kid living there and i saw these three girls there would i want to go to spring break probably yeah right but i don't know man i don't know you're hoping that you know it doesn't get as serious as it has in the in, the Euro in europe with it but you know for sure it's going to be the same thing in it but something that we're like letting consume our spring break i guess clearwater leaders met monday to discuss the idea of adding curfews for the beach or closing down the sand altogether they chose not to make a final decision <laughs> awaiting not. more guidance the which is funny isn't it like and the, and the guidance isn't coming which has been quite interesting to see how the governors are sort of taking the lead on it and being like okay if the president of the united states isn't going to take the lead on it because he's afraid of making a mistake or he's not sure what to do or he has different um powers at play pulling in different directions the government's now taking a bit more responsibility and again i think it's a perfect time if you actually are a leader who wants to impact or who wants to yeah impact change or make a difference or just or just selfishly if you just want to guarantee that you get elected um next term right wouldn't wouldn't the best way to do it would be to kind of come out front and center take off your tie roll up your roll up your shirt get get your hands dirty and really try and address the issues at hand people will kind of and again if it then 
if it happens to be no big deal, then you still look like you prepared and you, you still look great because you prepared and you made sure you dealt with things as they came, um, as they uh, as they came over your desk. And if it does turn into a big deal, you still look amazing because you decided to take the onus on yourself and make the change and not wait for somebody else to do it. So either way, I think it's a good look. But yeah, um, it's it's a strange time, strange, strange times in the States where this stuff is going on there. Um, and yeah, and then moving on, talk about stuff that's happening in the electronic music space. Um, unfortunately, one of my favorite clubs, uh, mix is going to close for the time being and i think judging by what's happening with all the other businesses and every other industry kind of suffering the effects of the coronavirus i think it's really shone a light on the um, on i don't want to say lack of infrastructure but a lack of support some of the nightlife Inst- institute in or the nightlife industry venues have especially in the uk especially in london um there's been a very it's been a very uh, fraught relationship, you know, between local councils and venues. I think maybe on the grand scheme of things, there is an acknowledgement that the nightlife industry does bring a hell of a lot of money into the UK, right? Or into some of the major cities. But there isn't a lot of uh, love lost. There's not a lot of mutual kind of uh, agreements or relationships in place that allows newer owners or newer promoters to kind of flex their i was kind of kind of being given a platform to build something new um it seems as if it's just the same old guard kind of you know changing their changing owners and or whatever or changing the deeds on the on the names but that's about it and i get the feeling that off the back of this coronavirus they, we're going to see a lot of the venues that we know and love just close completely um especially once everything gets up and running um, a lot of these places um, suff- only are only open when they're able to make money for the most part, right? Which is probably the reason why, even though, which is something that I've kind of been really frustrated about, that the fact that London has probably one of the best electronic music scenes out there. We probably have one of the best scenes in terms of supporters, in terms of artists and creators and DJs and promoters and people that just make things happen. But we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the... Uh, space the opportunity to do those things and to make them work really well and one aspect that doesn't really help is the fact that there isn't there aren't that many clubs in london that really promote or that really have a great solid uh residency program residency roster for the most part residence roster for the most part most of most of the promotions in the uk are kind of run by the big promoter gangs or the big promoter groups or companies um they book the same talent uh they go for usually some of the higher caliber djs to guarantee they get the ticket entries because unfortunately we don't have great um drinking or lice or licensing laws that allow pubs to open later so that you know some of the promoters have to have only a small window to make their money so they have to make sure they get the biggest acts in they can't take a gamble on local talent um so that is inevitably leads to uh a scene where people are mostly going to events where they're paying for tickets upwards of you know 20 30 40 pounds if you're going to print works and stuff which is just insane so once that so once that uh constant money once that constant kind of uh foot traffic has kind of gets pulled from you of course those clubs are going to suffer because no one's got any other need to go there it will be similar to like you know imagine we had really strict laws about which we're probably going to have when brexit gets fully um fleshed out imagine we had really strong laws against you know people coming in from abroad and performing or you know whatever it may be or being freelancers in the uk right it'd be the same issue because we wouldn't have uh we wouldn't have a um we wouldn't have a ready we wouldn't have a kind of willing audience to kind of give uh residents a chance because they'd be so used to hearing you know the top 10 DJs in the world playing in these nightclubs why would they want to go see some kid they never heard of so this whole electronic music the, well the whole thing's happening with the scene now is a bit it's a bit complicated on one side you've got clubs that gave no gave really no i don't say no care but they didn't necessarily go out their way to make the club nights affordable or to kind of you know challenge punters to some respects right maybe kind of throw up a few curveballs they always go for the kind of low-hanging fruit they pick the biggest djs and now of course they're in this weird predicament where you know people are not going out 
um, people not attending the events, gigs are getting cancelled, and now these same clubs are now asking the punters like me, and, like me and you, to support them and not ask for refunds, which is hard, right? Which is hard to do, or to maybe donate to their fund, or to kind of support a live stream that they're doing, right? It's difficult to have any sort of sympathy when you know these capitalist clubs come in, and even if they're independent, right? They don't necessarily look after you in the right way. And then they want you to then look after them. But then when they make, but then when they're back on their feet, would that would they kind of pay that forward? Will they do that? I'm not too sure they will. But regardless of that, there's still some really heartbreaking stories on hand. One one of them being that mixed garage, one of my favourite spots in London, um, specifically in the Hackney Wick area, is uh, going to put a pause on events for the time being. Of course, uh, this is a statement that they put out on their website. It says here. Mixed garage temporarily closed. Um, in light of the current world events, we have taken the res- regretful decision to temporarily close Mixed Garage Warehouse as a health and safety precaution. The entire events, music, and hospitality industry is somewhat of an existential crisis right now, so we're unable to provide clarity on reopening schedules. But we will announce reopening dates as soon as we can. We are holding on to any forms of positivity and support that we can get at the stage. We will need your support and your love in the coming months, right? As an independent business, we have been pushed to our very limits and are in survival mode. As such, we have to make some very difficult decisions to sacrifice in the short term, medium and long term. Anyone who has already purchased tickets for any events or our club mixed parties, we would like to reassure you that these events are valid for rescheduled dates. For further information, please visit. Uh, thank you for your cooperation and please accept our sincere apologies for any inconveniences may have caused the world is in real pain right now the music and community is is how we can heal uh, we are all in this together team mix so it's hard right to unpack that I think a lot of the clubs have the same sort of statements I'm not going to read every single one but essentially reading between the lines a lot of the clubs are essentially telling punters hey hold off on getting refunds because if you all if you all try and claim refunds you're essentially going to kill us and we're not going to be able to reopen once everything clears up anyway regardless but i guess if you're a punter or a discerning one or just someone that just has questions you will be a bit like you know what all these years of me giving you you know 20 30 quid a, a week to go see my favorite dj where did that money go to how much were you paying these star performers to come and play and really if you think about it if you're mixed right do you really need to fly in tons of berlin djs to come play at your club to make it viable could you not get away with you know having a night which they do anyway with club mix not really maybe club mix is similar but they could probably get away with programming the majority of their night around a whole batch of residents that come and just duppy the dance you only have to look at places like the yard around the corner from mix that has a probably you know i'm not sure what everyone else thinks but i think from my opinion i think the yard is more known for their more um underground weirder um need to know kind of like wink wink nudge nudge nights than they are for their big stellar dj nights i think that's what they're known for right you don't go to the yard to go and see someone you went you saw on wrestling advisor you go to the yard to go see uh you know an entire subculture represented there right um to go and get you know to go to go and party somewhere in a safe space with DJs that you know um, are coming at it for the right reasons and maybe makes a sort of suffering from that. And other places are doing the same thing, not just mix. I'm not going to isolate them because, again, I think it's, it's definitely one of my favorite places to go to. I've had loads of great experiences there, but I, I can definitely see both sides of it. But I also am aware that if you are on the other side and you are a punter and you are kind of someone that's like, look, I want to support the scene. I want to back these guys. I want to make sure I have someone to go to when I, when I want to let my hair down after this virus, after this whole pandemic is dealt with. Then you should be kind of aware that if you do try and refund an event now, you might be you might lead to their eventual closure. And I'm not really a big fan of refunding tickets anyway of events. I think if I don't go to an event, a uh, club night especially, and I don't have the chance to go, or I'm just tired. I usually just take a s- screenshot of it and just share it with somebody else on the social media or someone else that wants it. Do you know what I mean? I just, hey, here's a free ticket. You can take it and do it as you please. Most of the time, you have people hitting you up. They're like, oh, well, I want it, I want it. But it's got a QR code on it. Whoever takes it first and gets scanned has a ticket. So I'm not really a big believer in the whole refunding thing. You decide you want to go to an event. You don't want to go anymore. It's 20, 30 quid. Again, it adds up, don't get me wrong, but you've already decided you're going anyway. Do you know what I mean? So to get a refund, you know, especially minus the booking fee and shit, it doesn't make any sense. So I think if you had decided you went to go 
as a way to support maybe that is your donation just to kind of leave the ticket open if you want to go you go or if you don't want to go anymore just leave someone else to have a ticket once the events get rescheduled but i'm not really the biggest fan of refunding but i do understand if you do want to do that um so let's move on from there what else happened list here uh we have a ra update as well in the whole uh, pandemic what did ra say regarding the whole thing this is their latest oh this is kind of a rundown of all the stuff that's happened glastonbury's actually done as well isn't it? and that's a good and that's a big indication as to how serious the situation is glastonbury of course is going to happen i think it's in june right is it june july glastonbury ba, 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 ba. isn't glastonbury july where is Glaston? Is it July? It's July, I think so. I don't know. Anyway, it's late in the year. So I'm assuming Glastonbury is a good indication that we're going to be in this for a while. Even though Glastonbury, for the most part, they'd probably want to cancel it now because they're probably going to start prepping for it, what, now, right? End of April? Let me say end of March, beginning of April, they'll probably start prepping the, the site for everything, getting all the stuff in, because they usually do quite a good job of documenting the whole kind of run up to the event. So maybe that's probably why they decided not to do it, because they know, look, we're not going to, if we can't, if if this coronavirus isn't sorted out by now, there's no chance they can make it. But this is a quick little update from Resident Advisor detailing exactly what's happening with the whole coronavirus and the electronic music space or in the dance music space. Um, So it says here, this is from, the other day it says cities around the world have imposed the capacity limits on public gatherings or banned them altogether forcing kidnap crimes including bird kinds of clothes okay this is so on the 19th so we have here smart bars closed in chicago they've got a gofundme setting up we've got Mamo festival um in tonal is not happening for 2020 it's due to start again or it's due to start on 21st so everything from april is not is not happening of course which kind of echoes what's happening with coachella then you've got the Design Museum London has postponed its couple of comments electronic from Craftwork to Chemical Brothers. That's postponed. You got Portugal's Festival Forte scheduled for August has been cancelled as well. So that's a really big indication. A, a festival in August has got cancelled. So that means we're definitely if we you heard what um, Trump said in his press conference, looking at July, August. So those kind of so I'm assuming, you know, you're probably gonna be able to go to a festival again in September by the you know, to be optimistic. Um, the team behind Mint Warehouse and Leeds is postponing all events at the club. Um, Australian government has am- has amended its ban on public gatherings to 500 plus people, now restricting any non-essential indoor gatherings to 100. The clown country's events industry self-reported financial losses of over 100 million so far. Jesus Christ. With upwards of 65 people jobs impacted. 65,000, sorry. Then on March 17th, the other day, we have in Manchester, the Warehouse Project and Broadrick Live have postponed eight up-and-coming shows at the Deep Up in Mayfield, including Patrick Turpin's All Night Long and Joseph Caparatis and Shard the Wit. Those are three big, regardless of what you think of them as DJs, they are big, big names. They sell a lot of tickets. So those dates are definitely um, going to fuck them over. They're being ne- renegotiated now. Um, I'm assuming they don't want people to refund those either because those those are some high, 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 um, you know, footfall uh, ticket um, there, especially the Patrick Topping all night. That's going to be, you know, or Patrick Topping, however you pronounce it. Um, it says here, London venue, uh, Printworks as well is closing and postponing the rest of its seasons of events, which is a big blow for them because I remember seeing the email. They had a whole list of, you know, big, big, big names that they were going to have for their for their new season. So that's going to impact them a lot. It says here, a quote from Printworks says, we're in the process of rescheduling the proposed shows for later in the year and ask that you please bear with us. We are hoping to announce the new dates within the next seven days. Interesting. I wonder what that means for DJs. Are DJs then now going to be like, I'm, I don't know how it is, what kind of cat and mouse game is it? Does it mean the DJ has the power or has the kind of power in this kind of negotiation where they're going to demand more to secure their dates later down in the year because i assume these dates are the prime i don't know how it works out as a dj professional are, are the dates now the prime time to earn money or is it kind of a flat rate for the year is it kind of i don't know what, how that works so I, just, I assume some djs most djs anyway charge a bit extra new year's right um so it might be the same for the there might be a different sort of bracket price in terms of what it's in the year or maybe i don't know interesting to see that 
because would you want to reschedule it again anyway or would you just want to keep those dates that haven't been cancelled later in the year because imagine if they reschedule it for september but you've got some other big gigs lined up for september that you can't really move and those people that booked you in september won't want to renegotiate with those people that missed you in april march or march april june july really so it's a very interesting situation for everyone involved and of course london sister clubs x or y phonics and the jazz cafe have closed as well they were owned by one um controlling group right i forgot what they called um manchester spot soup kitchen is suit shutting until further notice club commission berlin reclaimed club culture has launched it was biggest digital club night on wednesday the 18th of march which is streaming i think live on facebook as well you should check that out if you want to check that uh, i think maybe on youtube as well actually so loads of closures all over the place rec check to live which i went to to see um you know Kavis is also postponed until 2021 so it's impacted everybody man it's a really really bleak situation but again hoping that everyone can band together and sort of figure something out um and then lastly but not is this article here from RA, which essentially echoes what I spoke about, how to help the scene. I'm not too sure if I agree with anything on here, but let's just quickly go through some things that we think might help out here. Mm, was that? No, I think this is the one I wanted to check out, how to help the scene, right? Where is it? There we go. Yeah, so Resident Advisors, um, uh, statement on cancelled events which i think was a really good primer it, it did lay the groundwork in a kind of really cool neutral way because Re resident advisors does have a tendency to kind of you know go a bit nutty with these sort of things but i think they explained it in a very clear way and kind of again it's up to the punters now to decide what they want to do with their hard-earned money but let's get this up on the screen here so see a resident advisor statement on cancelled events and refunds subtext in the grip of coronavirus pandemic we just need support we need to support our scene so support our scene they said right our scene hmm let's go so the following is there's a text so it says uh the coronavirus pandemic is disturbing human life around the world while serious illness and loss of life are the main tragedy of the virus it is taking an economic economic toll as well eliminating people's ability to make a living in a vast uh, range of industries and communities electronic music is no exception club nights and festivals are being cancelled or postponed in huge numbers to slow the spread of the virus in some countries all businesses other than grocery stores and pharmacies have been forced to close everyone's affected by these events including record shops record labels artists agents promoters and the innumerable staff who took look work on the door behind the bar and elsewhere at clubs and festivals simply don't know how they'll pay their bills at the months in the head in the months ahead sorry if these people and organizations can stay can't stay afloat for the short term there won't be a scene for us to enjoy in the future right which is a big big thing to kind of think about and again i don't know how conscious people are about these things like it depends what scene you're in in it london wise i'm not sure people how conscious people are about the way that they conduct themselves in clubs can effectively uh decide the future or you know the likelihood of their club getting shut down right i always go back to that kind of night where i was in my first kind of you know time going to the Bergheim. uh a few years back and me me thinking it was a good idea to you know take half a pinger on the dance floor and then me being kind of accosted by just a random punter or some gay guy who me said no 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 you don't do that here you have to go you have to go to the toilets you don't do that you don't do that here like yeah you know i mean like self-policing of the scene so that oh, I was like, oh okay cool my bad and then from there i was able to tell other people right the same sort of thing like hey you can't do that there it's sort of like you don't need security on a dance floor to kind of enforce these things because the punters inside that space know how sacred it is. They're grateful. Uh, they're appreciative of the ability to come into a safe space, dance, party, sweat, you know, get up to all sorts of, sort of nonsense and go home safely. They don't want, you know, me, some random kind of gringo to go there and kind of spoil their fun for them. So there is a kind of an, a, an attachment. There is a sort of like kind of an affinity, a connection with the scene. It is there. It, it's kind of, it's my place. You know, people say, oh, I'm going to go to my spot. That's actually their spot because they go there every single weekend. But I'm not sure if people are that conscious about it in London. I don't know. I don't think they are personally. Um, I think people are a bit detached from the scene in that regard. They just kind of, you know, go to a party and go home. They're not really, there's no real appreciation maybe for the programming. Maybe programming is not a good one. Yeah, maybe maybe there's a there's appreciation maybe for seeing a dj you like but not actually the, the what goes into the producing something like you know i used to promote parties myself in clubs and bars and i know just you know just just putting up posters cost you money right it just eats way eats way any kind of profit that you were going to make let alone 
getting lights and a smoke machine, you know, and a VJ. It's all nutty, but people don't really care about that stuff when you do it. When you do it, yeah, they just want to party, take their drugs, hang out, hook up, and go home. So I don't know, but you can only try. So it continues here. The article says the next few months will be in there, will be incredibly difficult for everyone. Artists and the people who book them won't be able to sustain such losses. Venues across the world face a situation where they have fixed costs, rent, mortgages, business rates, staff, and all other expenses that go into running a nightclub. And no other coming events can pay those bills. Oof. It's the same bleak picture for promoters and festivals, which are just as exposed by the crisis. Many uh, face financial ruin. But I guess if you had to choose between a few festivals dying right because there's too many of them there's just way too many festivals right every club has a festival now right it's just too much just ridiculous i will probably choose for a few of the shittier festivals or some or just even some of the good ones going by the wayside but us kind of keeping our club club landscape where it is because as great as festivals are i still think the bedrock of the scene is the clubs that's where if this that's where the kind of communities get fostered in for the most part if you talk to the people that are running some of the better festivals most of them have kind of their relationships have kind of stemmed from you know some drunken night somewhere stood in some cubicle somewhere debating about how they're going to change the world right i think that's usually what the, the name of the game so to kind of put all your eggs in the basket of the festival isn't a good idea and plus especially with the tory government in place there's no guarantee that festivals will continue the way they were in the past anyway um, we already know the history that they have with festivals and outdoor raves with you know the margaret thatcher era and acid house scene and all that stuff like you know the fest the kind of parties in the park and shit they're not the most welcoming of that scene anyway so clubs are probably the only place where we have to kind of hold on to their life so it continues here we understand that countless people around the world are facing f similar challenges and right now that many are, are feel are more vulnerable than people we're discussing here we're not asking you to prioritize our community over any other, but we feel a natural responsibility to support our scene. And we hope that you as an RA reader feel the same. With all this in mind, we have carefully considered our approach to refunding tickets and canceled and postponed events. So it's an interesting part. So number one, help save our scene, skip your refund, which is what I mentioned earlier, right? Um, in these extraordinary circumstances, we are asking those who can afford it to not request a refund of canceled events. That's standard. You know what the deal is with that one. Next one, what about postponed events? Many promoters are working on other initiatives that will help their cause, including postponing events, but transferring your ticket to a future date, uh, helping, you're helping clubs, promoters, and festivals stay afloat. Because I assume a lot of fest promoters have to pay a deposit for things. So if you cancel it, you lose your deposit. So that's a lot of money gone down the drain. You might have paid a, a deposit to the artist, the venue, you know, whatever it may be. So there's a lot of money tied up there. So I'd assume for a promoter and for the venue itself, they'd want that night to go on because that's a guaranteed money earner or, gar or guaranteed ability to make that money back uh, another point can i get a refund to an event uh cancelled as a result of covid19 starting today you'll be able to receive a refund for events tagged below without contacting council support which is brilliant right once the event organizer has authorized refunds the process is simple go to your order details page for the event if the event has been cancelled as a result of covid19 click the refund tickets button your refund request will be processed immediately you should get your money back within five business days so if you do want the money back and because if it's cancelled you might as well claim your money back anyway um, I assume, or if you want to do the promoters a favor and allow them to kind of have some sort of money to, you know, uh, cushion the blow of having the event canceled, then you can leave that. And the next one here, which canceled events are eligible? Of course, you work through it. What happens in the booking fee? RA is considered an independent company due to the highest increase in cost, support, and infrastructure required. Um, thousands, handle thousands of canceled events through the world. We need to retain the full booking fee in line of our terms. Cool no worries no booking fee don't get that back and we want to hear from you so there's a, so many events here look at the flags united kingdom france germany ireland united states canada bloody hell man so many events so many people um hurt by this man it's just mad isn't it again i think it's it's as with all things isn't it until it hits something that you're interested in you don't really give a shit or pay that much attention i guess it's the same with me isn't it I'm not immune to it myself, but yeah, it's just mad to see it all kind of written down. All these cancelled events are just bloody nutty, isn't it? But yeah, shame really, isn't it? But hopefully, um, some of them get some of them are most. There's a lot of postponed ones as well, which is good to see. So some future dates are trying to be worked out, and we kind of go from there. But yeah, it's a it's a dark time for the scene, man. Dark time for the scene. Support it if you can. Um, what else do we have here before we head off? 
Oh yeah, um, food spots are suffering as well, right? So I think tomorrow actually I'll stick with the streetwear, kind of lighten the mood because I've been talking about coronavirus too much actually. Um, let's go with something I thought was an interesting one, uh, an issue about food. Uh, da, 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 da. What's the what's the issue? Did you say about food? Quite a food one. Or should I move on to another one? Let's move on to another one. Actually, the food one might be a bit boring. What else can we talk about here on a list of things I thought was interesting? Oh, this is quite cool. Oh, this is quite interesting. This is quite funny. Um, this is an article from the Guardian, um, which kind of when I saw the headline, it made me laugh because you know it's something I had already kind of understood or believed without someone needed to tell me. I knew this was a fact, but um, the Guardian is reporting that. Uh, there's been a report out there that supposedly TikTok tries to filter out videos from ugly, poor, or disabled users, which shouldn't be surprised for anyone that's used TikTok. I've I've, I've only used it a couple of times. I, I have a tendency to always sign up to any kind of social media platform that kind of pops up just to kind of fuck around with it and see what it's about. I think that's the best thing to do, especially for the work that I do. I work within social media, I work within marketing, I work within community management. I need to be abreast of all the things that are going on. And just in general, for my own kind of entertainment and for my own things I go do on the side, it's good to kind of know what's going on. And I did notice when, of course, prior to having TikTok on my phone, or having to have my own account, I did notice a, pre- a prevalence of videos, the same sort of thing, right? The e-boy, the e-girl, um, the dancing, um, all that sort of stuff, right? But everyone that was featured was extremely white, extremely pretty, and extremely young. That's the kind of thing you kept seeing. Now, it could be a bias because people that are sharing them are tend to share those kind of images, but I tend to, that's the first thing I saw all the time. And then the other side of the spectrum, you've got the kind of people that, you know, your mum's house podcast takes a piss out of, right? So there's a distinct split in the audience or distinct split in the kind of content you're seeing, right? You're seeing content from, the, the kind of the cute young kids and you're seeing content from you know the people that occupy the fringes of society let's say to kind of use a politically correct term but then when i open the app and i went because when you open the app you're not following anyone it's just like whatever the discovery page or whatever the algorithm throws at you when you go through it it's just full of those kind of young pretty hot um young pretty kind of you know dancey you know people right that's what it's full of there's no one else featured on there and then when you think about the controversy, you think about the issue that um, Lizzo had earlier in the, or a couple of weeks, well, maybe a few weeks ago, where she was complaining that some of her videos or images got taken down. It makes you think that, yeah, of course, they would want to purposely kind of promote one side of TikTok that they kind of favor as opposed to the other. I'm not surprised by it at all, especially most of these startups. They look, they look really glitzy. They look really polished on the outside but then on the inside there's probably a manual process behind what gets featured on the discovery page maybe the algorithm isn't up to isn't where it needs to be to kind of discern what needs to be put onto the discovery page so there might be a team of people who are entrusted with selecting things that they think would be of interest to the tiktok community so i, I wouldn't be surprised as a manual thing which then could lead to a bias from the people that are doing it because they're human just like you and i right they, they might prefer a certain type of content or they might be given a mandate to only set some type of content so i'm not really surprised but this article is really interesting so it's from the guardian it says here um tiktok moderators were told to suppress um videos from users who appear too ugly poor or disabled as part of the company's efforts to curate an aspirational air in the videos it promotes according to new documents published on air intercepts now i don't know how you can prove if someone is poor on, on a live stream or on a, on a little 15 second tiktok video can is that a thing if you've got a good backdrop how can i tell you're poor you have to look for the chips in the wood frame or something or the door frame sorry i don't know how you tell that but you know maybe they have a way of doing it um, the documents detail how moderators for the social video app were instructed to select content for the influential for you feed in an algorithmic timeline that most users first port of call in the opening app like i mentioned as a result um, being selected for for you can drive huge numbers of viewers to given video but the selection criteria has always been remained a secret of course and that's that's a secret source and why would they tell anybody that with little understanding as to the amount of automation needed um, TikTok's moderators were instructed to exclude videos from uh, from the for you if they fail to one of any one of the number of categories. The documents show users with abnormal body shape, not limited dwarf or acrimony, Jesus Christ, who were chubby, obese, or too thin, 
or who have ugly facial looks or facial deform- deformities should be removed one document says since if the character appearance is not good the video will be much less attractive not working to be commun- recommended to new users now the brutal truth of this issue is that in all society which is why the whole like fat acceptance movement is great in one side because i feel like it's it's evolved and kind of matured into it's fat acceptance which means that we want to see because I'm, I'm a big fan of this too i want to see like you know i look at videos or pictures of comme des garçons runway shows from the 80s right from the 90s and you have so many different shapes and sizes featured on the runway even just armani shows right then it got to a point where i guess fashion designers or the industry just got a bit streamlined and they wanted to have a particular sample size so you know that was what kind of was catered down the runway then there was a fascination with youth and all this sort of stuff so but i'm, I'm still very much favoring runway shows reflecting the people that are buying it right so i'm very much so i'm very much um for the whole h&m featuring bigger ladies or people that don't look like they're 16 and only eat lettuce right because if you go to oxford street h&m you see regular people shopping there they should be featured on the posters because that's who's buying it but i'm also understanding that there's some people who do quite like traditional you know campaigns to feature really hot and attractive people who are younger than what they are and have maybe an unattainable level of beauty or of you know fitness or whatever it may be because that's something to aspire to now i don't think any girl or any guy is under the illusion that they're going to look at that person on the poster but they want to have a bit of a fantasy so um and and just as a personal thing if you're on social media and you see someone caught and cute you double tap right so there might be a kind of uh, stark reality of the situation is that people just don't want to share things that bum them out right or that kind of reflect what they're kind of going through they might want to share something that kind of takes them away from their misery so i don't know man i'm not sure sure if i'm that against it really um because i think we do it anyway you know um i don't know but it continues so similarly the documents show videos were to be removed from the feed if the shooting environment was shabby and dilapidated since this kind of environment is less fancy and appealing a tiktok spokesperson said the goal was to prevent bullying on the platform oh yeah really sure uh try it's like someone telling you it's like someone said look i'm I'm only taking a piss out of what you're wearing because i don't want anyone else to do it so you don't get hurt later on down the line it's like what you're my friend though why are you taking a piss out of me do you know what i mean um the report from december that showed the company was suppressing vulnerable users um in a misguided effort to prevent them from becoming a center of attention that could turn sour the categories of videos suppressed in the latest document are far broader than those of really in december however nor is any mention of bullying a discrepancy the company's attributes to a local interpretation of the wider policy yeah they say they've got some fucking great lawyers they're spinning spinning um spilling the information other documents published by the intercept show that the extent of tiktok's former rules requiring moderators to enforce chinese foreign policy overseas the site published the company's live stream policies which instruct you moderators to take down controversial content uh the language is identical to the one using the one in december at the same time tiktok said documents were old and they had been out since may last year but the intercept cites the source who indicated that these policies were in use throughout the 2000 of course we know this is true we know in the stand-up if you're a community manager or you have to do the for you page that they're kind of drumming home the fact that they only want to see cute young people on the page we know that's a fact they want to see more dancing that sort of fucking shit like tiktok is a weird tiktok is the only platform that actually makes me feel old legitimately feel makes me feel old like you go on it you just don't understand what, and i guess that's that's the definition of feeling old you just don't get it like kids just doing those kind of fucking dances and shit they're not even dances they're just like core they're not even choreographed they're like fucking um i don't know what you call them that's not a dance when i think of dancing i think of dancing like that isn't that doesn't look like how many of those sort of moves in a row can you do on a night out you can't necessarily do a whirl all the time right for every song or can you like you're just gonna whirl like on loop like what is going on here um i don't understand it i don't understand it anyway uh last bit here the live stream guidelines uh in question appear to largely the same or similar was here at the bottom here tiktok which is owned by beijing band beijing based tech unicorn by dance has been trying to separate its international efforts from its chinese home for at least a year but many staff including moderators are still based in china 
According to Wall Street Journal, the last of those Chinese-based moderators will be shifted to um, other work inside the company shortly, with locally based headquarters moderators picking up the slack. TikTok has already succeeded in moderating all U.S. content from outside China, but relied on China-based moderators for any other countries, in particular to provide 24-hour coverage for most of Europe. But yeah, we're not surprised, man. TikTok is is for the it's for this for the young hotties. It's not for the old uh, uglies or the young uglies for the most part. Um, it is what it is, isn't it? What can you do, man? If you don't like it, I guess you have to make your own app so you could whoa. Um, but yeah, madness. Anyway, we're an hour in. It's getting late now. Thanks so much for tuning in to Action on Zinger Show. As per usual, if you want more information regarding myself, check my link down below, xnozinga.com, for all that information in the description. I'm also on Libsyn now. I kind of moved my platform, my podcast over to Libsyn. If you're listening via the audio podcast, you'll see no difference. Just keep just, just keep yourself subscribed to my feed, but it will kind of refresh over the next few weeks, but that's pretty cool. So there'll be a link down below too for you to check all the other things out on the website or the Libsyn slug the kind of url for it so you can check that out if you want as well if you're watching via youtube as per all as per usual smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment um let me know what your thoughts if there's anything uh, i missed out some things you're interested in get uh, get in touch if you're watching or listening via the podcast app sorry uh, leave me a five star review and also share with your friends that'll be amazing and i'll see you guys again very very soon tomorrow i'll make sure tomorrow's show is a bit more streetwear centric a little bit more fun and loose some music reviews and you included there too to kind of keep it loose because you know coronavirus epidemic talk all day is a bit boring in it but yeah see you guys very very soon take care be safe and thanks for listening bye